Welcome to Board Gamers Anonymous, episode 114, the Board Game Geek Hotness. We'd like to thank Board Games for keeping us away from all of those horrible, terrible allergies that are right outside our door. You're listening to a proud member of the Dice Tower Network, dedicated to bringing podcasters together for the greater good of gaming. It's sort of like Voltron, but with better lip syncing. Find out more at Dicetowernetwork.com. Welcome to Board Gamers Anonymous, the podcast about board games and the insane fun we have at the table together. This is Chris. Hey, and this is Anthony. Hey, Anthony. What? Well, hold on a second. What's going on here? It's, it hasn't been a month yet. Why are we back? Well, I'm, I, mean, I think you just said allergies, so <laughs> we're stuck inside. <laughs> so we are literally the board game geek nerd geekiness stereotype that everyone thinks that we are? Uh, I'm currently fixing my glasses and trying not to sneeze, so yeah. <laughs> Apparently. Well done, sir. Well done. <laughs> this, this is what my brother This is what my brother pictures when I tell him I play board games. <laughs> <laughs> and he's right. <laughs> Dang it. <laughs> Well, we hate to shatter the, uh, you know, the the stereotypical super coolness that comes along with board games, but it is lousy with allergies outside, which makes it perfect board gaming weather. And we are happy to be back with you again, not just on our normal monthly episode, but Board Gamers Anonymous is back weekly, like we always wanted to be. And not so long ago, so we're glad to be here with you in your podcast feed or on your YouTube channel or visiting us on our website. But we're back, man. We're back. Yeah, it's awesome. But yeah, no, we we always wanted to kind of do this as often as possible. And uh, it, this is this is what we're going to do. I mean, it's going to be a little bit shorter, but I think that'll be a lot more fun just because we'll cover all the same stuff. But at the same time, we'll be able to talk about all the games we're actually playing instead of trying to jam it all in once a month. Plus, you can now subscribe on iTunes or Apple Podcasts, or whatever they're calling it these days, and get a new episode in your uh, phone every week or wherever you happen to download your uh, podcast. Yeah, if you're using any type of subscription service, please keep us subscribed because we are going to be coming out weekly and you want to keep up with the content because it's going to move fast and furious. So while it will not be that once a month, one and a half hour, two hour podcast, we're going to not cut down the content, but it's going to be much more concentrated and much faster. So Anthony and I are going to talk a lot more (laughs) and a lot quicker than we, than you're probably used to. Yeah, but hopefully not too fast. We'll see. I don't know. (laughs) Well, you can adjust your pod speed as needed, but that's true. Just slow it down. (laughs) I've done that before. That's that's true. (laughs) There you go. All right. So let's get onto it because as we said, it's concentrated, it's quick and it's here this week. All right, Anthony, so let's start off with our acquisition disorders. What games are you looking to get to the table? Yokohama Deluxe. Ooh. Uh, Yeah, the Deluxe. Got to throw that in there. This is just showed up, actually, in the mail because I backed this on Kickstarter. Tasty Minstrel took Yokohama. It's a Hisashi Hayashi game from Okazu brand. So it was released in Japan. actually played uh, the Japanese version of it. Somebody in my game group had imported it. Wow. And they did their... Orleans treatment where they added the metal coins and all the wooden components and this big giant box and the gold foil on the cover and it weighs 37 pounds whatever it weighs we got the super awesome version of this game uh, and there's a bunch of reasons why I'm excited to play it it takes place in Meiji era Japan which is very fascinating for me just because of how rapidly uh, they modernized it takes place It's an economic game rather than a war or area control or historical game, which is what a lot of games based in Japanese history are. And mechanically, it's very simple. You look at this laid out, it does not look simple. There's like 600 cards on the table, but it's actually fairly simple. There's only a couple things you do every round. It could play, I think, an hour, hour and a half. I mean, setup time ends up being like a quarter of that. So I'm pretty psyched to get this one out. It's sitting there. I've punched it. Just need to refresh the rules and get it out. Yeah, I saw that. It looks absolutely beautiful, and I can't wait to get to a table out here somewhere in the New York City area. Now, my acquisition disorder this week goes back to my uh, one of my original acquisition disorders, which was Scythe. Now, Scythe already has the invaders from afar, and you probably already picked that up, but you probably have recently seen Scythe, the Wind Gambit. Now, this is an interesting 
expansion because it comes with two modules, which seems to be the way expansions are going this day, which is not just like we're going to radically change your game, but we're going to give you two things that you can kind of throw into the game and kind of add new gameplay. Now, what I really like about this, first off, is the airships that come with the game. So each faction is going to get a miniature airship, kind of think of like a Zeppelin that's going to be flying around the board doing some new things. Now, with this airship, it's going to have an aggressive and a passive ability, and there's going to be a number of different opportunities to kind of mix and match. It's going to have a number of different cards. And that same combo is going to be effective for all players. So you're not going to get an individual situation, but everyone's airships are going to do the same thing. That's really cool. And it's it's something that I didn't expect. But now looking back, if you look at a lot of other games like Rivet Wars, going to the air is the natural conclusion here. So I'm really interested in that. But that's not all. The second module seems a little bit boring, but it's actually something I'm really interested in. It's the resolution tiles. There's going to be eight tiles in the game. And what this module allows you to do is ignore the standard end game trigger, which is the six star that comes out to the board. And instead, the resolution tiles will set up certain conditions for when the game comes to an end. I really, really like this because when you play Scythe or you play Tuscany or you play Euphoria or you play a number of other games, like let's say, for example, Terraforming Mars, and all the players have to meet a certain condition, you never know what to tell people how long a game is going to last or when they can expect the game to finally wrap up. And sometimes those games drag. So by having special end game conditions, you really have something to build towards. It's really going to focus the game. And this, while the miniatures always is something I love to see, I think these resolution tiles is going to be really what I'm going to play each and every game with. Yeah, yeah. I the, When I heard about those, I was like, no brainer, got to pick this up. And different ways to do it too, which is super cool. The really cool thing I think about this particular expansion is that half of it, the, uh, the airships, which yes. we'll see how well those turn out. But it was actually put together, at least started put together by a fan who I guess spotted an old picture that the, that the designer, the artist had done like three, four years ago. And add like a homebrew version of airships to his game and so now it's in the full game which is it's pretty cool yeah i'm loving this and especially to be able to see these big zeppelins kind of fly over the board especially if they're nicely detailed it's it's really really exciting so that's our acquisitions anthony let's take it on to our at the tables what have you been getting to the table this weekend so this is one that uh I haven't actually played a ton, but I got a chance to play it again this week. And I think Steve Jackson Games finally announced that they're releasing it. Uh, That's Port Royal. Uh, So the version I played was imported. I'm not sure where from. It was in English, though. So (laughs) somewhere uh, with English version of of the game. But it is uh, it's it comes in a small deck box. It's a single deck of 120 cards. And what you do uh, on each turn is you're going to it's a combination of press your luck and card drafting, which is interesting. If you think about it, you're going to draw cards one at a time, as many as you want, so that you have a a tableau out there to choose from which one you want to purchase. But if at any point in time you get multiple of the same type of ship, uh, I believe three of them, then you bust and you lose your turn and it goes to the next person. And that's not good because it's a set collection game. So if you can't buy a card on your turn, then you are going to have a hard time getting the set you need to win the game. Now, the card drafting part is really cool because once you've laid out the tableau and you've, you're like, OK, I'm done. I'm going to take this card. It goes around the table after that and people get a chance to buy the next card. Some of these cards will give you coins. The ships that can possibly defeat you, you can get Uh, swords on your own cards to combat them and then there are contracts that are out there or expedition cards i think they're called that you can fulfill for a lot of extra points with different uh symbols that are on some of the cards some of the cards you you pull in have nothing on them just victory points other ones have special text that let you do special things one of the ones i really liked for example was when i pulled all those cards out i got to buy two of them if i could afford it on that first turn and another one is if i got up to five cards in that row uh, before i busted i got a coin at the end of my turn and money's really tight so i had that little engine going where i got extra money almost every time and then i could uh get extra money for some of the different colored ships and then buy two cards so it was it was pretty cool uh, there are two variants here, I think, they were telling me. You can play it that the first person at 12 points just straight up wins the game. 
or you can play it so first person at 12 points who has also completed an expedition uh i did not complete an expedition which is why i think this came up <laughs> because they were telling me how i would not have won if it was the if we were playing the other version which i'm like okay cool we'll play the other version um but either way, I mean, I, I like both versions of the game. This is this was really quick and fun, and there's a surprising amount of strategy in this tiny little box of cards. So I don't think you can really find it right now, at least here in the U.S. If you're in Europe or Canada, I think it's out there. But it is coming soon. Steve Jackson has the uh, the rights. And the, the new cover of the game looks kind of awful, but trust me, the cards inside the game itself is, is great. So track this down when it comes out. So would that be a buy then for you? Oh, yeah, yeah, I think so. A uh, small little deck box. I mean, I think if you bought it right now, it'd be like 50 bucks. Wow. Don't do not do that. Um, <laughs> I, I'm sure it'll cost like 15 or 20 uh, when Steve Jackson gets it out, depending on how big of a box they try to jam it in, which it's only 120 cards, so it shouldn't be a big box. All right. Well, a game that I got a chance to get to the table with great thanks to our friends Howard and Zach was they put together a print and play of Hardback which is the new Tim Fowers game that's Ooh. currently on Kickstarter. So you too can print all this out, find some old cards to kind of stick in sleeves and be able to play this game. So now probably most of you have played Paperback, which is a word building game based upon kind of de Dominion deck building. Well, Paperback kind of set the standard a bit. So now when you're playing hardback, it's not an expansion, but I guess as, you know, Eric Lang would say, this is kind of like the spiritual successor to paperback. So hardback is kind of almost like a prequel, get it? Prequel, like the quill that you write with, because, ah. see, see, we did some <laughs> funny there. Well, actually he did the funny, I'm just using the funny here. So basically what you're looking at here is once again, a word building game. But instead of using the Dominion deck building, what you're using is a Star Realms deck building mechanic where based upon the different genres, or if you use Star Realms, based upon the different factions, if you use similar genres in your words by buying those letters. So if you buy green and you have a couple of green letters in your word, then they're going to trigger some additional abilities, which is pretty interesting because... Each of the different genres, whether it's horror or adventure or trashy romance, is going to give you an extra bonus. So, for example, the trashy romance novels are going to allow you to trash cards. Get it? So, it's pretty interesting because you're building words in order to get money, to be able to buy other letters from this market, to build up your deck, to build out words. And it has that Star Realms mechanic where you'll be able to build a word that could have, because you purchased it, a letter that is then reoccurring. So if you remember, Star Realms has those kind of bases that kind of sit to your side and protect you and give you an additional ability. Well, the same thing is true here. So let's say you put together the word shirt and the S is one of those special letters. It's It's kind of done horizontally. So then it kind of moves over and sits on your side because you played it in a word. And now throughout the game, you always have that S available to you to play in the word, which is great. Now, you don't have to use that S, but you still get that ability. Now, just like Star Realms, there's a way to take out those kind of like special letters. If another player uses your letter in their word, it takes it out. Now, it goes back into your discard pile, so you can play it again later on. But this is a little bit of a different way to play the game. Now, there's two additional modules that he currently has in play. There's adverts, which basically allow you to purchase victory points. And then there are these endorsements. So if you play, let's say, for example, a seven-letter word, you will be able to score additional victory points. And then as the game goes on, if someone scores an eight-letter word, they get that bonus. And then if you score nine, then you move that bonus to you. So there is that one bonus that's moving around the table throughout the game, which incentivizes you to play bigger and bigger words and not have to worry so much about those small words that's going to score you a lot of cash. The artwork is nice. The graphic design is very sharp and very clean. I enjoy this game a great deal. And I think this, I, I won't say it fires or gets rid of paperback because paperback is, once again, that Dominion mechanic. 
but I do enjoy hardback, at least in this prototype form. There may be some changes before it eventually hits the market a lot better. So paperback is a buy for me, and if you haven't backed it yet, you should go check out the Kickstarter because not only will you be able to buy paperback, but Tim Fowers is offering a 20% discount once you back it as, as a special code to go to his website and be able to purchase his other games there, which I did. So I picked up Paperback, I picked up Burgle Brothers, and I picked up The Fugitive, which I always meant to do but was never able to do. So now I've done, and I would say buy them all. Nice. Yeah. And the puns are great. The puns so. are amazing. <laughs> uh, this one looks good. I backed it as well, so I'm excited for this one when it comes out. Sounds good. All right, Anthony. So we talked about our acquisition disorders, and we talked about our hitting at the table with BGA. Let's move on to our feature review, which is Board Game Geeks, The Hotness. Now, if you are a hardcore board gamer, you've probably been at Board Game Geek at some point and wondered and thought about, hey, what's that hotness list on the left side? So what we wanted to do with this episode and with you know upcoming episodes is take a look at The Hotness, the games that everyone's clicking on, everyone's reading about, everyone's talking about. See where games are rising and falling, what new games are hitting the market, and, you know, some old classics might still be hanging on there because they're just getting such great table play. So with that said, we're going to talk about the real hotness of the hotness because that's really what's kind of coming up. So, Anthony, no real big surprise here. Our number one game on the hotness is Gloomhaven. Why do you think that is? Uh, I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> I mean, this this game is a juggernaut. This is the game of the year right now. So, and it's on Kickstarter at the moment, and there's like tens of thousands of views per week on that page. So, I think it'll be up there for a while. I remember you and Daniel talking about this way back when, and uh, I'm starting to get a chance to pick this up. It's a little bit of a higher price than its initial Kickstarter, but it's definitely something you should pick up or wait till market because I'm going to buy this at some point. So that's our, you know, number one ranking there. It's it's holding high. But our number two here is Super Mario Level Up, the board game here. What why why is that even here? I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> I like it. I think it's funny. Uh that might be why it's there. Because okay. I feel like this happens sometimes, though. If you watch this, is occasionally a game will get onto the hotness for whatever goofy reason, and then it'll rise quickly because everybody will go in there and ask why it's on the hotness. I don't know. It's a reimplementation of an old hobby game, King Me. Um, it's a mass market game. I I will probably end up getting it because my son loves Mario. And if it's not a really crappy roll and move game, I'm interested. But I can't imagine that many people are interested from the hobby side. We'll see. Well, it's on the rise. And then next up is Brass. Now, you all know about Brass. Well, this is Lancashire. This is talking about their Brass Kickstarter. So, Anthony, why why is that up here here? Yeah, I mean, this is one of the most popular games of all time. It's ranked 25. Uh, they've created a new version of Brass called Brass Birmingham. So the old version is now called Brass Lancashire, whereas before it was just Brass. Uh, it's Roxley Games. They did um, uh, a bunch of stuff that looks fantastic. So this new version looks amazing. And I think that's just people are talking about it. It is still on Kickstarter. So that would put it there, I think. Okay. And we have a new entry, Dark Souls, the board game. What do we know about this? Other than it was a big old Kickstarter last year, and it's supposed to be brutally difficult for a game that was also brutally difficult, video game. I imagine it's probably getting close to shipping or people are starting to get their copies, which tends to put these things up there. So be interested to see if it's any good. I did not back this, but it, it sounds like it could be a good game. And a game that we saw at Gen Con last year, Sagrada? Yeah, this is a cool looking little dice placement type of, uh, I guess it's you're building stained glass windows. Yes, with different color dice. Yeah, so that one looks pretty cool. This one also shipped recently, so people are just getting their hands on it. Well, that's dropping a little bit, but it's still on the hotness, so that's great. Next up is Path of Light and Shadow. What do you know about this? I don't know much. I know it's coming up on Kickstarter in the next couple of weeks. Uh, it's supposed to launch in May. It's coming from Action Phase Games. I think it's supposed to launch after Aeon's End ends. Um, and it's got, it looks great. But other than that, I mean, I don't really know much about it. Haven't really seen a copy yet in the wild. I think people are just getting psyched for that upcoming Kickstarter. Okay. 
And our next one up is not a big surprise here. Terraforming Mars is still standing strong, despite its quite, quite challenging components here. <laughs> I'm going to say that every time. I it's am going to say this every time. <laughs> well, we should just be glad it's ranked so highly because, I mean, hopefully, eventually it gets a deluxe version. Yes, I'm saying That you don't have to build so. yourself. Right? You're not kidding. Well, <laughs> you know, <laughs> let's not say any more about this, but... <laughs> up next is all about the Cthulhu Hara. Arkham Hara, the card game, is up here on the list. Yeah, I mean, I think this is going to be another one of those perennials. Like, if you look at the longer list uh, on the main page with the 50 games, Lord of the Rings card game is always on it. Sure. It has been for years. Yep. Arkham Horror will also now always be on it because they release a new pack every month. So it's it's going to be up there for a bit. Okay. And then a game that we just recently talked about, Yokohama. Yep. Because everybody just got their copy in the mail, so they're all talking about it. <laughs> so, and they probably played it sooner than I will. But um, yeah, it's beautiful and can't wait to get it out. And then next is one of the new classics, Terra Mystica, is up here on the hotness. Yeah, I mean, Terra Mystica is almost always on the hotness somewhere. I think it's higher because the app just came out. In fact, I know it's higher because the app just came out. And the app, by the way, is fantastic. So if you've played Terra Mystica before and don't mind board game apps... I know some people out there are like dead set against them. Get that app. It's expensive. It's 10 bucks. You might want to wait until it goes on sale. I know a lot of people are doing that, but it's really good. Okay. And then next up is Yamatai. That's the new Days of Wonder game. Yeah. Yeah. That's all I know about it. I mean, it's Bruno Cathala and it's Days of Wonder and it looks beautiful. So that's really all you need to know, right? Yeah. <laughs> I think it's out in Europe. So hopefully it's coming out here soon. Yeah, I'll have, a, I'll have at least a preview, if not a review, next week on that. So stay tuned. Next up is a game we just talked about, which is also Scythe. Yeah, and I think um, also has been in the hotness forever and new expansion coming. So keeping it, keeping it fresh there, my friends. And then next up is Too Many Bones. All right. So this is where my solo peeps come out what and up, showcase peeps? there. <laughs> Too Many Bones is, I think, starting to ship out. This is um, from Chip Theory Games at Hoplomachus. It is a, uh, I, th- I don't think it's solo only, but it's big in the solo community, uh, at least thus far. It is a large, high quality production. Everything's got like, you know, the neoprene mat and the chips and the dicer. You know, it's it was expensive. So I ended up not backing it and I wish I had. But it's, uh, apparently it's quite good. And it is uh you know, I don't know how long it'll stay up in the hotness, just, just getting into people's hands, but it's going to be hot on the solo list, at least for this year. Okay. And then up we have Hannibal, Rome versus Carthage. All right. So this one I had to look up because I wasn't sure. I don't, I'm not a big uh, war games kind of guy, but it's a two player war game from 1996. It is number 107 on board game geek. Wow. And it was, it was in the top 100 for a while until all these new games knocked it out. There is an anniversary edition currently on Kickstarter. So those people who like this and haven't played it in a while or have never heard of it, but like two-player war games, more on the strategy side, yeah, there you go. There's an anniversary edition deluxified on Kickstarter for you. Sounds good. And talking about deluxe editions returning from the dead, Legends of the Five Rings, the LCG? Yeah. Yeah, we heard about this at Gen Con last year. Yes. Uh, and they just released the actual information, some of the... The screenshots, the pictures, so everybody can start to see what the game is, you know, a general sense of the rules. I think it's coming out at Gen Con this year. And I know a lot of people are really, really excited. This was a CCG for decades. Yes. And AEG, they effectively killed it off when they sold it to Fantasy Flight. It's coming back as an LCG. And I will wait to hear from L5R fans out there how good it is because I did not play this very much back in the day. Yeah, I'll have a preview review of that coming up next week. And really, there's very little information. You could check out their page right now. There's some kind of information about the cards. But like I said, I'll talk about that next week. But in particular, this is kind of a massive release for them. And from what they're saying, when it comes up to Gen Con, this is going to be their largest print run ever for Gen Con. Yeah, maybe we'll get copies then. Maybe. (laughs) You never know. We'll see. I'll All right. wait in line. <laughs> All right, so that's our feature review for this week, the Board Game Geek's Hotness. Now on to our question of the week. Anthony, what do you have for us? All right, guys, so every week, five days a week, unless I forget or I'm sick, 
Uh, I post a question of the day on Facebook, uh, Google Plus, and Twitter, and sometimes on the on the Guild as well. And we get a lot of good responses. I've been doing this for a little while now, and a lot of people write in, and I really love some of the responses we get. So I wanted to start doing it on the podcast, and since we're going to be going weekly, perfect chance to do that. So every week, I'm going to be picking out one of the questions that got a lot of good responses and share some of the feedback that I got from people and some of the answers that they provided. So if you want to get a shout out on the podcast and hear your answer, make sure you hop into the Guild or the Facebook page and you know let us know what you think on these questions. Don't have to answer all of them. Just, you know, the best answers are going to get up. doesn't matter which question it is. <laughs> so this week's question of the day, super select version, um, the, the one I picked out, is what's your highest rated game that's not in the top 250 on Board Game Geek? So what game have you rated the highest that is not in that jumble of super high rated games? Some of the answers that we got, some pretty good ones in here. Daniel shared he has uh, StarCraft the board game. Um, which is number 303. He's got Bomb Squad, which is 2,137. So that's pretty impressive. And then Shadow Rift, uh, which is 1,419. All three of those are in his top 10. We had Tim, who shared his Guilds of London, uh, is one of his favorite games, and it's not even in the top 1,000 yet, which, you know, given the, the limited print early on of that and how hard it is to teach, I'm not too surprised, but it is a pretty good game. And Guillerme, he shared a few games as well. Dawn of the Zeds, third edition, um, which I know it's it's for Victory Point game, so I know it's real hot with the solo community, uh, as well as Comancheria, another solo, and Snowdonia, which is another Tony Boydell game. So two mentions for Tony Boydell on this list. So hopefully he can get a game up in that higher echelon soon. A lot of good games here. I know that there was a few on Twitter as well. Uh, some people wrote in and then a handful that were like right up close to the 250 mark that we were actually surprised weren't in the top 250. Yeah. I mean, Chris, what about you? I mean, what's yours that's probably highest rated that you have not seen in the top 250 yet? Well, not not a big surprise here for me and for us is Defenders of the Realm, which is a 10 for me. There is some art and graphic design issues, but it rates 307. And I just can't understand why this Richard Lanius game has not gotten the love that it deserves. Obviously, they now have their new version that's kind of the post-apocalyptic kind of Mad Max one, which is kind of taking away a little bit of the love. But this game should never, ever be 307. It's outstanding. And I just want to give a little bit of a shout out to 301, which is Aquasphere. Now, this game always goes on sale. It's, it's kind of a running gag, but it's really a great game. So please pick this game up and... Take it off the, the uh, you know, the bargain bin because that's another game that deserves to be in the top 50. Yeah, yeah, I hear you, man. My One of my favorite games. I don't have any 10s that are outside the top 250. I don't have that many 10s, period. But um, the the one that I was, I guess, not too surprised about, but I wish it was higher, is Spirium, uh, which was like 438. Uh, this is one of my favorites. It's just this great, elegant, quick little game that people are just not interested in because the production quality is not that high, but it was very inexpensive. And, you know, there's definitely an argument to be made that it needs an expansion to kind of build out what's there because there's not a lot of variability in the tiles. Either way, it's it's in my top 10. And the fact that it didn't make it into the top 250 is sad for me. That is quite sad. So make sure that if you're not doing this already, get onto Board Game Geek and rate those games so that they'll rise and more people will get them to the table. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. If you have one there, it's not up there, you know, go rank them for next week and the week beyond and week beyond. Make sure that you hop into Facebook and all those places and answer the question of the day. It's I put something up every day, often something quick. The more interesting and in-depth your answer is, let us know why uh, you're answering the way you're answering and um, we, we might share it. So, yeah. So if you want to get your comments, questions, information out there to the whole Board Gamers Anonymous multiverse, please check us out on Facebook. If you like us, you'll have access to all those questions. You can find us also on Twitter, BoardGamersAnonymous.com, our guild on Board Game Geek. And please, if this podcast is doing great stuff for you, subscribe. The more subscribes that we have and the more five-star ratings that we get, the more people get into board gaming out there in the Board Gamers Anonymous universe. Until next time, this is Chris. 
And this is Anthony. And whatever hotness you got to the table, save us a seat because it's getting hot up in here. <laughs> well, at least board game wise. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. Presumably. Yeah. Be careful because it's cardboard and heat is cardboard and not a good thing. Actually, they should probably rename it. It shouldn't be the hotness. It should be like the sleeve and the protected, right? Because the games that you really do love, you want to kind of coat in plastic and not exposed to heat. That would be bad. That would be the last thing that a board gamer really would want to do. Yeah, I mean, what if there's humidity, too? Oh, I mean, no. You're going to warp funny. everything. <laughs> it's, it's really the one time where it's, it should be the dryness, <laughs> not the There hotness. you go.